We went after Iraq. They did not knock down the World Trade Center, okay? It wasn't the Iraqis that knocked down the World Trade Center. We went after Iraq. We decimated the country. Iran's taken over, okay? But it wasn't the Iraqis. You will find out who really knocked down the World Trade Center because they have papers in there that are very secret. You may find it's the Saudis, okay? But you will find out. But it wasn't Iraq. And Donald Trump says, uh, quote, elect me and you'll find out who really knocked down the Twin Towers. He's saying, elect me and I will expose 9-11. They may go ahead and kill him. I mean, you need to pray for Donald Trump right now, folks. And by the way, we need your prayers. The first thing you have to know about 9-11 is that the official narrative is a conspiracy theory. Vice President Dick Cheney admitted in 2006 that there was no evidence linking Osama bin Laden to 9-11. Nobody has evidence to support the official narrative that Osama bin Laden orchestrated 9-11. But uh, so we've never made the case or argued the case that somehow Osama bin Laden was directly involved in 9-11. That evidence uh, has never been forthcoming. In October of 2001, this video was released and shown to the people of America and the world, and we were all told that this was Osama bin Laden accepting responsibility for the attacks on September 11th. But let's compare the Osama in this video to a photograph of the known Osama. When you compare the two, you'll notice that the Osama in the video has a shorter nose. He also appears to be a little chubbier. As the Osama in the video waves his hand, look carefully. You'll see he's wearing a ring and a wristwatch. Jewelry is forbidden by people of the Islamic faith. You'll also notice that when he signs on this pad, he's signing with his right hand. We know that the real Osama was left-handed. So we have to ask this question, where did this video come from? And why was it fabricated to mislead the people of America and the world? If you visit the FBI.gov website, you'll find the 10 most wanted list. And on that list, of course, is Osama bin Laden. You can pull up his wanted poster, and on that poster is a list of charges that he's wanted for. The curious thing is that nowhere in the list of charges is any mention of September 11th. The Muckraker Report contacted Rex Toom, a spokesperson for the FBI, and asked why was there no mention of the attacks on September 11th on Osama's wanted poster. Mr. Toombs' response was, we have no hard evidence linking Osama bin Laden with the attacks on September 11th. some breaking news coming into the MSNBC newsroom. A federal judge has approved a request by prosecutors to officially dismiss all criminal charges against Osama bin Laden. To officially dismiss all criminal charges against Osama bin Laden. There was constant discussion about him hiding out in caves, and I think many times the American people have a perception that it's a little hole dug out of a side of a mountain. Oh, no. This is it. This is a fortress, yes. a complex, multi-tiered, bedrooms and offices on the top, as you can see. Secret <laughs> exits on the side and, the end, and on the bottom. Cut deep to avoid thermal detection. A ventilation system to allow people to breathe and to carry on. The entrance is large enough to drive trucks and even tanks, even computer systems and telephone systems. It's a very sophisticated operation. Oh, you bet. This is serious business. And, and there's not one of those. There are many of those. Okay, what, what can we say to such a person? Okay, all we can do is appeal to scientific values. And if he doesn't share those values, the conversation is over. Okay, if someone doesn't value evidence, what evidence are you going to provide to prove that they should value it? Okay, if someone doesn't value logic, what logical argument could you provide to show the importance of logic? 
Now that we know Osama bin Laden was not responsible for 9-11, who claimed that he was? Former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak was on BBC one hour after the North Tower collapsed, blaming Osama. The uh, uh, bin Laden sits in Afghanistan. There is a source well, of terror. Who else terror. you identify, though? Uh, because we're not saying he's responsible for this. Necessarily. Bin Laden, who is behind this very attack, when you and the whole world will realize. Mossad, the Israeli intelligence, warned the United States before 9-11 that a major terrorist attack would take place. This report was confirmed by Mossad officer Jabal Lviv. There was a report, you'll recall, that the Mossad, the Israeli intelligence agency, did indeed send representatives to the U.S. to warn, just before 9-11, that a major terrorist sure, sure. attack was imminent. And that's why Israel had information that they were giving the American government specific information. There will be an attack in North America uh, within the th next 30 days. There will be uh, a hijacking of aircraft, and those aircraft will be used as flying bombs. That was available at the time. In 1995, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu wrote a book called Fighting Terrorism. In this book, he writes that militant Islam will bring down the World Trade Center. So I wrote a book in 1995 and I said that if, it, if the West doesn't wake up to the suicidal nature of militant Islam, the next thing you'll see uh, is uh, the militant Islam is bringing down the World Trade Center. Uh, BuzzFeed dug up an old quote from Donald Trump talking about a large-scale terror attack 19 months before 9-11. In his 2000 book, The America We Deserve, Trump wrote, I really am convinced we're in danger of the sort of terrorist attacks that will make the bombing of the 1993 Trade Center look like little kids playing with firecrackers. Trump also mentioned the mastermind of the attack, writing, quote, One day, we're told that a shadowy figure with no fixed address named Osama bin Laden is public enemy number one, and U.S. jet fighters lay waste to his camp in Afghanistan. He escapes back under some rock, and a few news cycles later, it's on to a new enemy and a new crisis. Uh, the alliance between Israel and America has always been extremely strong. It's about to get even stronger. Uh, President Trump and I see eye to eye on the dangers emanating from the region, but also on the opportunities. Both Netanyahu and Trump wrote books about 9-11 well before it happened, and that Osama bin Laden was responsible. Interesting. It began when this woman was watching the Twin Towers burning from her apartment in New Jersey. She noticed three men on top of a van, posing for pictures with the towers burning in the background. And I could see that they were, like, happy. You know, they, 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 were, they didn't look shocked to me. You know, they didn't look shocked. I thought it was very strange. The witness called police, who stopped the van hours later and arrested five men. All five, it turns out, were Israeli. They were turned over to the FBI. Sources tell ABC News during a check of national security databases, some of the men were listed as having had connections with Israeli intelligence. At the FBI, that set off alarm bells. A major terrorist manhunt began, and just six hours after the attack, the van was stopped at a roadblock by patrolman Scott DiCarlo. We were asked to detain the van and the passengers. They were just removed from the vehicle, patted down for safety precaution, and, uh, you know, detained. 911 call at 410 Park. I think once the uh, FBI arrived, one of them stated that they were on our side. So there's something to that effect. Five Israelis were arrested for filming and celebrating as the first tower was hit. As they were being arrested, one of them told Officer DiCarlo, we are Israeli, we are not your problem. Your problems are our problems. The Palestinians are the problem. Please search the vehicle and explosive residue was found. The five Israelis arrested, Savan Kurtzberg, Paul Kurtzberg, Yaron Shmuel, Oded Elner, and Omar Mamari were part of a Mossad front company called Urban Moving Systems. Tuval Aviv is a counter-terrorism advisor to the U.S. Congress. 
but was once a spy for Israel's secret service Mossad. He says Urban Moving was a front company for Israeli intelligence and that some of its workers were spying illegally in the U.S. Israel has engaged in intelligence gathering in friendly countries. Some of it is done with permission and some of it probably has been done without permission in areas that is vital to Israeli interest. Secretary of State Colin Powell also confirmed their arrests. I'm aware that uh, some Israeli citizens have been detained. With respect to why they are being retain detained and the other aspects of, of your question, whether it's because they are in intelligence services or what they were doing, I will uh, defer to the Department of Justice and the FBI to answer that. The FBI wasn't satisfied. Channel 4 has learned from intelligence sources that some of the men's names were already known to American counterintelligence. Paul Kurtzberg admitted serving in an Israeli army anti-terrorist unit. He refused to take a lie detector test for 10 weeks. I was uh, serving in a special unit in the army, and it's not a big secret or something like that. But uh, there are things that I have to keep to, uh, to myself as uh, loyal to my country. Some of the Israelis were discovered to be Mossad agents after their names were run through the database. This was confirmed by Vince Canistaro, former chief of operations for counterterrorism, CIA. The FBI needed the answers to three important questions. Who were these men? What brought them to that parking lot on the morning of September 11th? And did they have any advanced knowledge of what was going to happen that day? And at that point, we were taken for another round of questioning, this time related to our allegedly being members of Mossad. The fact of the matter is, we are coming from a country that experiences terror daily. Our purpose was to document the event. Our purpose was to document the event. They went on an Israeli talk show to explain their actions. Their excuse was that they were coming from a country which experiences terrorism daily. So their purpose was to document the event. How did they know there was going to be a terrorist event? And that's why Israel had information that they were giving the American government specific information. There will be an attack in North America. Uh, within the th next 30 days. There will be uh, a hijacking of aircraft and those aircraft will be used as flying bombs. That was available at the time. What about this question of advanced knowledge of what was going to happen on 9-11? How clear are investigators that some Israeli agents may have known something? Well, it's very explosive information, obviously, and there's a great deal of evidence that they say they have collected, none of it necessarily conclusive. It's more when they put it all together a bigger question, they say, is how could they not have known? Almost a direct quote, Brett. They knew because they were Mossad agents. Mossad officially warned the United States that there was going to be a major terrorist attack. Their van was at the scene as early as 8 a.m. After examining the confiscated footage, police confirmed that the Israelis were in fact celebrating as the first tower was hit. I've got so many questions, but you are vindicated. This has got to be the 50th time the last six months on the radical Muslim celebrating, not just in New Jersey, but New York, Palestine, all over. What do you have to say? They're still attacking you, though we've got Dan Rather on video. We've got New York Post. We've got Washington Post. We've got, uh, I mean, what's going on here? Well, I took a lot of heat, and I was very strong on it, and I held uh, my line, and then all of a sudden, you know, hundreds of people were calling up my office. I was the other day in Sarasota, Florida, and people are in line, and we had 12,000 people, which is fantastic. And the people were saying, many of the people from New Jersey, four or five people said, Mr. Trump, I saw it myself. I was there. They talked about Patterson, but they said, I saw it myself, Mr. Trump. I was there. So many people have called in, and, and on Twitter, at real Donald Trump, they're all tweeting. So I knew it happened, and I held my line, and people wanted me to apologize, and uh, we can't do that. People like you and I can't do that so easily. Now, we can do it if we're wrong, Alex. You apologize. I'd apologize if I was wrong. But they were celebrating, and they were celebrating the fall of the World Trade Center. I think that's disgraceful. I watched when the World Trade Center came tumbling down. And I watched in Jersey City, New Jersey, where thousands and thousands of people were cheering as that building was coming down. 
thousands of people were cheering. So something's going on. We got to find out what it is. I uh, know Donald Trump. Uh, I know him very well. Uh, and I, I think his attitude, his support for Israel is clear. He, he feels very warmly about the Jewish state. Israelis, Jews to be precise, were arrested celebrating 9-11. Trump is going around telling the world that Muslims were celebrating 9-11. Is he covering for Israel? Keep in mind that Trump and Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu both wrote books about 9-11 well before it happened. We had uh, one report early on from another intelligence service that suggested uh, that uh, the lead hijacker, Mohammed Atta, had met with Iraqi intelligence officials in Prague, Czechoslovakia. Um, and that reporting waxed and waned with a degree of confidence in it and so forth. has been pretty well knocked down now at this stage. What we're giving you are facts and conclusions based on solid intelligence. For more than an hour, Secretary Powell displays photos, holds up a chemical vial that suggests anthrax. I'm sitting there. Well, how stuck did with you feel? I felt you, terrible. You... And six months later, the intelligence community is still standing behind their original judgments, even though nothing has been found. I understood the consequences of that, of that failure, and as I've said on many occasions, I deeply regret that the information, some of the information, not all of it, some of the information I presented, which was multi-source, was wrong. And it is a blot on my record. But, you know, I, there's nothing I can do to change that blot. Israeli intelligence tried to link Iraq to 9-11 by creating a lie that one of the hijackers, Al-Qaeda member Mohammed Atta, met with Iraqi officials in Prague where they gave him anthrax. Even though this was proven to be a lie, Netanyahu told Congress that Iraq should be invaded anyway. Uh, I think... Well, excuse me one second. I mean, uh, you're making a connection between the Taliban and Iraq? Yes, I am. I'm saying that the, uh, if you look at those who harbor terrorists uh, and those who uh, support terrorists... Uh, and no, support I guess I was looking for a connection between September 11th and my understanding why we went to the Taliban is there was a connection there. They were harboring somebody that we believed did the act on September 11th. Yes, that's the first reason why right. you did it. Now you're going to take me from September 11th to Iraq somehow? Yes, but I'm saying something else. I'm saying the connection is not whether Iraq was directly connected to September 11th, but how do you prevent the next September 11th? Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11. Netanyahu was still trying to link them together. Two days after 9-11, Netanyahu went on television and use the attack to justify invading Iraq. What is important to understand uh, is that you have to dismantle the entire terror empire, and especially before its main practitioners, the terror states of Iran and Iraq, acquire nuclear weapons. And this, I, I think, has been a wake-up call from hell. It is telling us, you have the power now to act. Summon the will. Let's take a look at the anthrax letters which killed five people. We know Israel lied about Osama bin Laden orchestrating 9-11. We know Israeli intelligence lied about Mohammed Atta getting anthrax from Iraqi officials in Prague. Now look what it says on the bottom. Death to Israel, Allah is great. Gee, I wonder who wrote this. The FBI concluded that the anthrax was created and sent by Dr. Bruce Ivins of the U.S. Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases. He was not a Muslim. He was a Christian Zionist who loved Israel. He wrote in 2006, By blood and faith, Jews are God's chosen and have no need for dialogue with any Gentile. He supported Bush's mass murder of Muslims in Afghanistan and Iraq. He committed suicide once the FBI was onto him. Initially, it was believed that Al-Qaeda sent these letters. Well, four Israelis were arrested living next door to Mohammed Atta in Florida. They were all Mossad agents. This was confirmed by the Justice Department. I can't include the footage because if you try to re-upload it, YouTube will block it worldwide. The full report with the FBI searching their apartments is still available online. Just look for this. So, Israel officially warned the United States that there's going to be a major terrorist attack soon. 
Mossad agents were living next door to Muhammad Atta, and their excuse was that they were spying on Arabs. Instead of stopping the terrorist attack, they let it happen and got caught celebrating. Muhammad Atta was used to justify not just the invasion of Iraq, but Afghanistan as well by way of the fake Osama confession. Atta didn't have ties to Afghanistan or Iraq. He was tied to Israel. They're living, they've got, they've got these 7th century or 14th century goggles that they're uh, looking at the world through. And, you know, if we, if we pipe Baywatch over on the satellite dish, that's a, you know, an offense that they're willing to die for. Sam Harris and other Israeli propagandists will often claim that 9-11 happened because Muslims hate our freedom and they blew themselves up because we allow women to wear whatever they want. Well, according to the FBI, some of the hijackers weren't even Muslim. Muhammad Atta was hanging out at strip clubs, banging strippers and snorting cocaine. These guys had money flowing out their ass. I mean, excuse my language, but they never seemed to run out of money. I mean, they was just, just tossing money left and right. I mean, it was just like, oh my God. And they had, they had mass supplies of cocaine. The entire video is silent and yet the images unnerving. The 9-11 mastermind and his accomplice laughing it up and then going through their lines for a performance of martyrdom wills. Jarrah frequently stumbles through his own martyrdom tape. Can't maintain a serious tone. His Al-Qaeda handlers coach him to be more dramatic. Start again, one of them scolds him off camera. This speech requires passion. Why don't you try a different approach? A second man chimes in. This is not reality jihadism. This is more, in fact, scripted, edited, stylized. Hijackers Yad Jarrah's cousin, Ali Jarrah, was arrested in Lebanon for spying for Israel. He confessed that he was spying for 25 years. Not one, but two hijackers were tied to Israel. Muhammad Atta lived next door to Mossad agents, and Ziad Jarrah's cousin was a Mossad agent. Better yet, Ziad Jarrah's passport miraculously survived the explosion. Listen to a terrorist threatening his own country. The streets of America shall run red with blood. He was a suburban California kid, a lover of heavy metal, who became one of the most wanted men on the planet. The grandson of a Jewish doctor, Adam Perlman morphed into Adam Gadon, the American mouthpiece of Al-Qaeda. September 11th demonstrated that America is not invincible. Adam Gadon, real name Adam Perlman, is an Al-Qaeda terrorist who is Jewish. He comes from a family of well-connected Zionists. His grandfather, Carl Perlman, was the first local chairman of the Bonds for Israel campaign, chairman of the United Jewish Welfare Fund, and was also a board member of the ADL. In the past, Adam was arrested for beating up Muslims. He also wrote essays condemning Muslims as bloodthirsty terrorists. Then he began working with the Mossad, putting out Israeli propaganda about 9-11. And the other variables that Bob wants to invoke here, and again, specifically on Islam, economics and political oppression, don't account for this behavior. The 19 hijackers were living in Germany. They all were college educated. Most of them had PhDs. These are engineers and architects. All the brothers who took part in the raids on America were dedicated, strong-willed, highly motivated in individuals with a burning concern for Islam and Muslims. And they had to be to be chosen for such a difficult mission. They were definitely not failures looking for a way out. Look at the pilots, Muhammad Atta, Marwan Shehi, Ziad Jarrah, Hani Hanjour. All of them had, had lived and studied in the West. All of them had the world within their reach if they had wanted it. But how could they live with themselves if they were to enjoy this worldly life while their ummah burns. 
Israel lied about Iraq harboring terrorists and did the same thing with Palestine. In 2002, Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon said that Al-Qaeda was operating in Gaza. Three days later, Mossad agents were arrested by the Palestinian Authority while trying to set up an Al-Qaeda front. Al-Qaeda has always been a tool Israel used to justify bombing another country. Israeli soldiers got caught working with Al-Qaeda at the Israeli-Syrian border, and photographs were taken. This alliance was confirmed by Ephraim Halavi, who was the director of Mossad during 9-11. He ran the operations. He also publicly admitted that Al-Qaeda was being treated at hospitals in Israel, which is harboring terrorists. There have been reports that Israel has been treating wounded Syrian rebel fighters in its yes, hospitals yes, on the border, yes. including fighters from Nusra Front, yes. uh, which is of course the Al-Qaeda proxy in Syria. Um, do those reports worry you that Israel's helping wounded Al-Qaeda aligned fighters? As I said before, in a different context, it's always useful also to deal with your enemies in a humane way. So it's purely humanitarian, you say? So there's no tactical or political or strategic... I didn't say there's no tactical. I said the main consideration, Fine. the immediate consideration Fine. is humane. But the tactical issues involved, I mean, you know better than me the phrase blowback. You don't think there's going to be blowback against Israel if you get into bed with an, a group like Nusra Front? No, I don't think so. I don't think there's going to be blowback. Why? Because I think that, the, unfortunately, the rules of the game in Syria are such that you can do anything that is not able, is not possible to be done anywhere else. Yeah, I think people said that in Afghanistan too. Would you also treat Hezbollah fighters? No, I would not treat... Have you not just contradicted what you told me no, 60 I seconds ago? No, no. But humanely no, treating no, your enemies? No, no. I think as far as Hezbollah uh, uh, fighters are concerned, with them we have a different uh, account. So let me be clear, you would, you, you're happy to treat Al-Qaeda fighters, we have, but not Hezbollah we fighters? Have, we have a different account with Hezbollah, a totally different account, because Hezbollah has carried out the type of uh, actions against us which pre preclude us from going into what the Al-Qaeda has done. Al-Qaeda, to the best of my recollection, has up to now not attacked Israel. But has attacked your number one ally and protector and sponsor in the United States of America. There is a quote-unquote war on terror being going on for 15 years. In 16 years, Al-Qaeda, including its rebranding called ISIS, has never attacked Israel despite being next door. ISIS attacked Israel once, but that was by accident. Former Israeli Defense Minister Moshe Lan publicly said that ISIS accidentally attacked Israel, then apologized. Trump and Israel's propaganda minister Alex Jones brags about an interview Trump did on the day of 9-11 where he said bombs were used. Let's take a look. Donald, you're probably the best known builder, uh, particularly of, of, of great buildings in the city. There's a great deal of question about whether or not the damage and, and the ultimate destruction of the buildings was caused by the airplanes, by architectural defect, or possibly by bombs or, or aftershocks. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, it was an architectural defect. You know, the World Trade Center was always known as a very, very strong building. Don't forget, that took a big bomb in the basement. Now, the basement is the most vulnerable place because that's your foundation, and it withstood that. And I got to see that area about three or four days after it took place because one of my structural engineers actually took me for a tour because he did the building. And I said, I can't believe it. The building was standing solid and half of the columns were blown out. I mean, so this was an unbelievably powerful building. Uh, if you know anything about structure, it was one of the first buildings that was built from the outside. The steel, the reason the World Trade Center had such narrow windows is that in between all the windows, you had the steel on the outside. So you had the steel on the outside of the building. That's why when I first looked, and you had big, heavy I-beams. When I first looked at it, I couldn't believe it because there was a hole in the steel. And this is steel that was, you remember the, the width of the windows in the World Trade Center, folks. I think, you, you know, if you were ever up there, they were quite narrow. And in between was this heavy steel. I said, how could a plane, even a plane, even a 767 or 747 or whatever it might have been, how could it possibly go through the steel? I happen to think that they had not only a plane, but they had bombs that exploded almost simultaneously. Because I just can't imagine anything being able to go through that wall. Most buildings are built with the steel is on the inside around the elevator shaft. This one was built from the outside, which is the strongest structure you can have. And it was almost just like a, uh, like a can of soup. You know, Donald, we were looking at pictures all morning long of that plane coming into uh, building number two. And when you see that uh, approach the 
the far side, and then all of a sudden, within a matter of a millisecond, the explosion pops out the other side. Right. I just think that it was a plane with more than just fuel. I think, obviously, they were very big planes. They were going very rapidly because I was also watching where the plane seemed to be not only going fast, it seemed to be coming down into the building. So it was getting the speed from going downhill, so to speak. Uh, it just seemed to me that to do that kind of destruction is even more than a big plane because you're talking about taking out steel, the heaviest caliber steel that was used on a building. I mean, these buildings were rock solid. And, uh, you know, it's just an amazing, it's an amazing thing. And it's not right to call up and then extrapolate and connect him to 9-11 when he came out on the day of 9-11 and the day after on Fox and on CNN and said, I believe there had to be bombs in those buildings. It was brought down by explosives. A plane doesn't do that. And then describe the architecture of Tower 1 and Tower 2. If he was an insider, he wouldn't have said that. Um, a lot of people ask, uh, how is it possible that um, a Boeing plane would be able to destroy the, or two planes would be able to destroy the Twin Towers? Because they were constructed to withstand like a 707 attack. Well, it's tremendous power and tremendous heat. And people were willing to die, and uh, when they're willing to die, and when they're willing to become kamikazes of a sense, uh, there's very little you can do about it. I mean, the, the heat and the power, actually it was amazing that the, the initial jolts didn't jar the building as much as people would have thought. But the, the tremendous amounts of fuel that was dumped on the building and 1,600 degrees temperature, I guess that's probably more than anything could take, no matter what. I said, how could a plane, even a plane, even a 767 or 747 or whatever it might have been, how could it possibly go through the steel? I happen to think that they had not only a plane, but they had bombs that exploded almost simultaneously. They were constructed to withstand like a 707 attack. Well, it's tremendous power and tremendous heat. And people were willing to die. And uh, when they're willing to die and when they're willing to become kamikazes of a sense, uh, there's very little you can do about it. So, Trump and Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu wrote about 9-11 well before it happened. Israelis were arrested celebrating 9-11, and Trump covered it up telling the world that Muslims were celebrating 9-11. And Trump said on 9-11 that explosives had to have been used, but two days later he flip-flopped and said that the planes brought down the buildings. To this day, Trump is still lying and pushing the Israeli narrative that Muslims somehow brought down the World Trade Center. I speak to you today as a lifelong supporter and true friend of Israel. I am a newcomer to politics, but not to backing the Jewish state. In 2001, weeks after the attacks on New York City and on Washington, and frankly, the attacks on all of us, attacks that perpetrated, and they were perpetrated, by the Islamic fundamentalists. Mayor Rudy Giuliani visited Israel to show solidarity with terror victims. I sent my plane because I backed the mission for Israel 100 percent. I mean, you look at Larry Silverstein, who's a terrific owner in New York and a very good friend of mine who I just called. I was very worried about him because I assume maybe he was in the building. He took possession of the building one week ago. As you know, he just bought the World Trade Center. Right. Seven weeks before 9-11, two Israeli billionaires purchased the lease to the World Trade Center. Larry Silverstein and Frank Lowy, who was an Israeli commando. Lowy was also a part of a Jewish terrorist group called the Haganah. The Haganah not only committed terrorism against British forces in Palestine, but also bombed Jewish sites in Iraq and elsewhere in the Middle East, making it look like Arabs did it, to increase Jewish immigration to Palestine. Naim Galadi and many other Israelis write about this. I bring this up because when Frank Lowy was young, he was framing Arabs for political benefit, to increase Jewish immigration to Palestine. Decades later, he purchases the lease for the World Trade Center and frames Arabs for political benefit. After 9-11, what happened? 
the United States began bombing Israel's enemies in the Middle East. Larry Silverstein, who also purchased the lease to the World Trade Center, admitted in Israel that he began designing a new World Trade Center in 2000, while the buildings were still standing. And so, next thing you know, we've got the designs of a building. And the first design meeting was in April of 2000. And construction began shortly thereafter in 2002. But we ran into a problem. We couldn't collect the insurance because the insurance companies didn't want to pay. There were 22 insurance companies defending 22 insurers who didn't want to pay their obligations under the policies. And so they took me to court. And I had to beat them in court, the lower court, and then had to take an appeal and win in the upper court. So they owed me four and a half billion. A new governor was just elected, Elliot Spitzer an old friend who I knew well. I said, Elliot, if you don't help me, I'll never collect from the insurance companies. And guess what? He listened and he said, you know what? You're entitled. I'm going to get you the money. And in six months, he got me the four and a half billion dollars. The insurance companies didn't like me, but at least I got the money. I remember getting a call from the uh, fire department commander telling me that they were not sure they were going to be able to contain the fire. And I said, you know, we've had such terrible loss of life. Maybe the smartest thing to do is, is pull it. Uh, and they made that decision to pull. And then we watched the building collapse. I see what's happening down there is a mess, and the developer is actually a friend of mine, but he didn't want to build this building either. If you look back at the records, I mean, when it was first foistered upon him, Larry Silverstein is a great guy, he's a good guy, he's a friend of mine. Trump's good friend, Israeli billionaire Larry Silverstein, admitted that he began designing a new World Trade Center in 2000. Also, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu wrote in 1995 that militant Islam would bring down the World Trade Center. Interesting. Silverstein and Netanyahu are actually good friends as well. Silverstein admitted that Netanyahu would call him every Sunday. We heard Silverstein bragging about making four and a half billion dollars from insurance, so 9-11 was good for him. Was 9-11 good for Netanyahu? Benjamin Netanyahu has publicly said the September 11th attacks have been good for Israel. Netanyahu said, quote, we're benefiting from one thing. And that is the attack on the Twin Towers and Pentagon and the American struggle in Iraq. Netanyahu said that 9-11 was good for Israel because it swung American public opinion towards supporting a war against Iraq. If you doubt Ma'ariv and Haaretz claims, you can read Netanyahu's book, Fighting Terrorism, and you'll see that he sources both those news outlets several times. Netanyahu also told the New York Times that 9-11 was very good for Israel. Asked tonight what the attack meant for relations between the United States and Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, the former Prime Minister, replied, It's very good. Then he edited himself. Well, not very good, but it will generate immediate sympathy. He predicted that the attack would strengthen the bond between our two peoples. Because we've experienced terror over so many decades, but the United States has now experienced a massive hemorrhaging of terror. Netanyahu has publicly stated twice that 9-11 was good for Israel. How does Trump feel about Netanyahu? My name is Donald Trump, and I'm a big fan of Israel. And frankly, a strong prime minister is a strong Israel. And you truly have a great prime minister. In Benjamin Netanyahu, there's nobody like him. He's a winner. He's highly respected. He's highly thought of by all. And people really do have great, great respect for what's happened in Israel. So vote for Benjamin, terrific guy, terrific leader, great for Israel. President-elect Trump, 
my friend, congratulations on being elected President of the United States of America. You are a great friend of Israel. Trump and Netanyahu, who have been friends for years, are both being financed by Israeli billionaire Sheldon Adelson. Adelson gave over $100 million to Trump's campaign and hailed Trump as the best president for Israel ever. First of all, there's nobody on this stage that's more pro-Israel than I am. Okay, there's nobody. I am pro-Israel. For those who aren't aware, two towers were hit by planes, but three towers fell. Fact is, World Trade Center 7 was never hit by a plane. The official narrative is that office fires from debris caused it to symmetrically collapse at near free fall speeds, which is scientifically impossible. President Bush at the time even admitted that explosives were used. He told us the operatives have been instructed to ensure that the explosives went off at a, high po a point that was high enough to prevent people trapped above from escaping. We know that explosive residue was found in the van of the dancing Israelis. Well, another urban moving systems van got caught, but this one was full of explosives. They also tried to blow up the George Washington Bridge. There was a bolo, which is a be on the lookout for a particular van with there's supposed to be a few occupants in there. And the bolo basically stated that this van may be on its way to destroy the George Washington Bridge or something like that, if I remember correctly, and blow up the bridge. The FBI has now put out a nationwide APB all points bulletin for a white Chevy van with New Jersey registration. Written on the back is Urban Moving Systems. Two or three men arrested on the New Jersey Parkway. Deborah, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Uh, that is the information that I'm getting from two sources, that there was a van either on the New Jersey Turnpike or the Garden State Parkway, and that it was near the George Washington Bridge. There were two or three men who were in the van. The van was pulled over. Uh, it is not clear why the van was pulled over, but when it was, uh, law enforcers found uh, uh, tons of explosives inside of the van. But some very um, intelligent and aggressive cops also stopped another terrorist attack from happening on the George Washington Bridge. CBS2 has learned exclusively that two men are in custody tonight after being arrested at the George Washington Bridge with an entire truckload of explosives. Now I'm told that those explosives could have been enough to blow up the entire span and all the cars and the people that were on it. And word late tonight that two suspects are in FBI custody after a truckload of explosives was discovered around the George Washington Bridge. That bridge uh, links uh, New York to New Jersey over the Hudson River. Whether the discovery of those explosives had anything to do with other events of the day is unclear, but the FBI has two suspects in hand, said the truck uh, load of explosives, that enough explosives were in the truck to do great damage to the George Washington Bridge. I was watching the towers, and though I wasn't the closest, I saw them crumble to the earth like they were full of explosives. And they thought nobody noticed the news report that they did about the bombs planted on the George Washington Bridge. Four non-Arabs arrested during the emergency, and then it disappeared from the news permanently. They dubbed the tape of Osama, and they said it was proof. Jealous of our freedom, I can't believe you bought that excuse. The George Washington Bridge was owned by the Port Authority. Chairman of the Port Authority at the time of 9-11 was Jewish billionaire Lou Eisenberg. He financed Trump's campaign and was later given the role of U.S. Ambassador to Italy. He bought himself a seat to Trump's inauguration, as did Israeli billionaire Sheldon Adelson. Jewish billionaires Silverstein and Eisenberg had property that was destroyed or was intended to be destroyed on 9-11. Urban Moving Systems, a Mossad front company, got arrested and explosive residue was found in their van. Another one of their vans was stopped, except this one was full of explosives that was set to blow up the George Washington Bridge. Was Lou Eisenberg a random guy in all this? Well, he's actually a Jewish Zionist billionaire. He strongly supports Israel. He was the chairman of the Port Authority who leased the World Trade Center to Silverstein and Lowy. He is very close to Trump, just as Silverstein is. It's a safe bet that he had foreknowledge as well. 
Well, it's in, hard the year, to believe. In, in the year 2000, Donald, you considered running for president. If, if, if you had done that and if you had been successful, what do you think uh, you'd be doing right now? Well, I'd be taking a very, very tough line, Alan. I mean, uh, you know, most people feel they know uh, uh, at least approximately the group of people that did this and where they are. But, um, boy, would you have to take a hard line on this. This just can't be tolerated, and it's got to be very, very stern. This is, as you and I were discussing before, Alan, this was probably worse than Pearl Harbor. This country is different today and, and it's going to be different than it ever was for many years to come. Uh, I think that, uh, I think that today um, was another expression of the strength of this country and the strength of democracy. Um, nations, democracies, don't go to war easily. And they usually debate and argue uh, before they do. Sometimes they have to be bombed into going to war. In fact, that's what happened in World War II. All of Europe had been conquered. You had to, uh, America was actually bombed in Pearl Harbor. Uh, uh, and, was, and that was a pivotal event that opened the eyes of Americans. And once their eyes were opened, they gathered the, the power that is available in this great free nation. And uh, the result was preordained. Uh, I think in a, in a similar way, the bombing of September 11th opened the eyes of uh, Americans to see the great conflict and the great danger that faces us. And once opened, then the, the overpowering uh, uh, will of the majority of the people of the United States, of the, the steamroller, is uh, inexorably moving to, to decide this battle. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said that 9-11 was good for Israel. Israeli intelligence got arrested celebrating 9-11. Witnesses saw them hugging as so many people died. As Netanyahu told Congress in 2002, sometimes they have to be bombed into going to war. Israel bombed the United States on 9-11 to manipulate you into fighting their wars. That's all the info I can fit in one hour. Today we focused on how 9-11 was done in part two, we'll focus on why it was done, as well as other connections Trump has to the Jewish state. Trump knows exactly what's going on, and he's covering up 9-11 for Israel. If you like this video, share or feel free to re-upload this onto your channel. If you want to support me, all I ask is that you sit down people close to you and show them this video. If you can show this to veterans, that's even better. I know it's an uphill battle, but we don't have much of a choice. Try to educate people on APAC, the Israeli lobby, and more importantly, the attack on the USS Liberty in 1967 when Israel murdered 34 Americans and wounded another 174. This was another false flag similar to 9-11, only it failed. Was it Israel's interest that caused them to bomb and kill 37 innocent Americans on the Liberty? A terrible, a terrible tragedy, and that's what happens when a spy ship spies. A terrible, a terrible, a terrible even tragedy. to your allies, I even agree to with your you. allies. I they shouldn't be called an ally. They don't deserve it. Four days into the 1967 Six-Day War, these men witnessed and survived one of the most deadliest attacks on an American vessel by a close U.S. ally, Israel. The torpedo entered the ship right about here. Forty-two years ago, Israeli jet fighter planes and torpedo boats bombarded an American intelligence Navy ship, the USS Liberty, with a series of attacks. The assault lasted two hours. According to survivors, killed 34 crewmen, injured over 170 others, and nearly sunk the ship. The whole story of it being a, an accident is just not true. Although for decades the Israelis insist the incident was a case of friendly fire, the victims of the attack confirmed the Israelis were fully aware they were attacking an American ship. Israel claims that they were not flying a flag and that uh, was a mistaken identity, but I know for myself that we were flying a flag. A lot of it we believe was covered up, uh, that it was an intentional act by Israel to sink the ship with all hands, no survivors. Uh, why do you think they would have bombed the ship? Their next plan was to attack the Golan Heights. So 
the troops they had in, in, on the Sinai now had to be moved to take the Golan Heights. Um, the fact that the Israelis were massacring um, Egyptian troops, Egyptian prisoners of war. They had so many of them, and once again, they wanted to move all the troops they could to the Syrian border, and uh, they really co they couldn't handle the, the, the Egyptian prisoners of war. So they massacred them. So it's perceived that they thought that we were intercepting the fact that that happened. This is a provocative act of war, would you not agree? Oh, yes, definitely. What, what happened? How did the U.S. react when this happened? Uh, USS Saratoga, which was some, I can't tell you how many miles away, but it was several miles away, launched aircraft to come to our aid once we got the Mayday signal out. Uh, and those jets were recalled uh, by McNamara, I believe. Uh, they relaunched, and the second wave was called back by President Johnson himself. That he did not want, for whatever reason, did not want the U.S. involved in this on our side. What do you think that is? Because I think Israel has too much money and they can have too many controlling interests in our government. I know there was a conspiracy between our government and Israel at the time, so uh, that's the reason why they didn't, they didn't pursue it and why the, the investigations and the interrogations were done and, and covered up because of, the, because of the alliance between Israel and the United States, which I think is, is wrong. I, I don't care who they are. Uh, you just don't slap a hand for killing 34 guys and wounding over 172 people on board a ship for, for no apparent reason. As far as I'm concerned, it's just outright murder. And so 42 years after the Israelis bombed an American warship, the survivors of the USS Liberty are still demanding justice. They say they will continue to raise awareness about a provocative act of war that the United States not only refused to respond to, but also helped cover up. Now, I have two comments on my deep respect for human life, okay? I'm opposed to our wasting our military in the Middle East on behalf of Zionist Israel. Thank you. Okay. All right, well, let, let me just tell you that Israel is a very, very important ally of the United States, and we are going to protect them 100%. 100%. They've been our most reliable, uh, it's our true friend over there, and we're going to protect Israel 100 percent. What we need to stand up and say is not only did they attack the USS Liberty, they did 9-11. They didn't. I have had long conversations over the past two weeks with contacts at the Army War College, at headquarters Marine Corps. And I've made it absolutely clear in both cases that it is 100% certain that 9-11 was a Mossad operation, period. First, the disbelief. And what I show them immediately afterwards is an interview with a demolitions expert named Danny Jowenko. And it shows the third building at the World Trade Center going down. And they look at that, and I said, now you understand that if one of the buildings was wired for demolition, all of them were wired for demolition. And that's it. That's the tipping point. Getting into arguments about who was flying what and where they were and whether there was nanothermite, those things are true, but they're incidental. The thing that's necessary is to tell people three buildings went down, the third was not hit by a plane, it was wired for controlled demolition, therefore all of them were wired for controlled demolition. And at that point, the reaction is rage. First disbelief and then rage. 9-11 has led directly to 60,000 Americans dead and wounded. God knows how many hundreds of thousands of people in other countries that we've killed or wounded or made homeless. This is an open wound. And what Americans need to understand is they did it. They did it. And if they do understand that, Israel's going to disappear. Israel will flat-ass disappear from this earth. I sent a film to one of my colleagues, and it basically had Americans grieving over their dead, coming back. And I showed one of them, it was a woman just wrenched by grief, you know, over, over her dead soldier. And I said, you know, if Americans ever know, ever know that Israel did this, 
they're going to scrub them off the earth, and they're not going to give a rat's ass what the cost is. They are not going to care. The first thing marked is astonishment. They didn't know. They, they truly didn't know. And these are not unintelligent people. They really didn't know. And the next statement is rage, real rage. The Zionists are playing this as truly an all or nothing exercise. Because if they lose this one, if the American people ever realize what happened, they're done. The military has not been bought. The military is loyal, but it has not been bought. And if it ever understands this, really, really deeply understands this, and this is what I got when I put some of these things to the Army War College and to headquarters Marine Corps, I mentioned to a contact at headquarters Marine Corps, I said, you know they did 9-11. And it was, you don't mean it. I said, absolutely. And if they ever understand that, these people are history. And I said, what's going on? And who knows what it is? You know the famous Trojan horse. I mean, is this a Trojan horse? I doubt it, but it could very well be. And they don't have paperwork. They have no documentation whatsoever. They have no documentation. And then we're bringing them into this country. We don't know who they are. And you look at what happens in California, and you look at some of the things that happen, including, by the way, flying airplanes into the World Trade Center. Why are we doing this? Build a safe zone in Syria. Get the Gulf states who have a tremendous amount of money. I mean, Saudi Arabia was making a billion dollars a day before the oil went down. So now they're making half, okay? They're making a lot. Get them to pay. They're not paying. The other ones aren't paying. We're paying. We always pay. We're the sucker. We're the sucker. We're like the stupid sucker. And we're not going to pay anymore for all this stuff. And anybody that comes in, if I win, they're going back out. We're going to do it humanely and everything, but they're going back out. We don't know where they are. We don't know who they are, where they come from. And we've already had some. You saw the couple that came in from Iraq, where they were already planning different things. One in California, one in Houston, I believe. And they're planning things. No, we don't need it. We got enough problems, folks. We got enough problems. We got enough problems. So I, I read this the other day, and I said, wow, that's really amazing. That's really incredible. And it's uh, the snake lyric. On her way to work one morning, down the path along the lake, a tender-hearted woman saw a poor, half-frozen snake. Interesting. His pretty colored skin had been all frosted with the dew. Oh, well, she cried, I'll take you in, and I'll take care of you. Take me in, O oh, tender woman. Take me in, for heaven's sake. Take me in, O oh, tender woman. Sighed the vicious snake. She wrapped him up cozy in a curvature of silk and then laid him by the fireside with some honey and some milk. Now she hurried home from work and that night, as soon as she arrived, she found that pretty snake she take and revived. Take me in, O oh tender woman. Take me in for heaven's sake. Take me in, O oh tender woman, sighed the vicious snake. Now she clutched him to her bosom. You're so beautiful, she cried. But if I hadn't brought you in, by now you might have died. She stroked his pretty skin, and then she kissed and held him tight. But instead of saying thank you, that snake gave her a vicious bite. Take me in, O oh tender woman. Take me in, for heaven's sake. Take me in, O oh tender woman, sighed the vicious snake. I saved you, cried the woman, and you've bit me, heavens why. You know your bite is poisonous, and now I'm going to die. Oh, shut up, silly woman, said the reptile with a grin. You knew damn well I was a snake before you took me in. Does that make sense to anybody? Does that make any sense?